because he looks out of the window and he sees this. And he says, look, it's a cow, cows are brown. And the physicist laughs to himself and he says, no, come on, there's at least one cow which is brown. And the mathematician looks at the physicist and laughs. He says, no, there's at least one cow in one field in England, at least half of which is brown. <laughs> Mathematicians like to tell this story because they think it illustrates how rigorous and uh, how pure our discipline is, how far away we are from everyone else in science and the rest of the world. There's an old saying that all biology is chemistry, all chemistry is physics, all physics is maths, and we like to think of ourselves as mathematicians on the top of the pile. But I actually don't think that's a very helpful attitude to have. I think as mathematicians we should be working together with people in, in other sciences and in other disciplines to try to better understand the world, to work together for the greater good. So to some extent, I like to think that this is what I do in my day job, at least in my own head. This is me doing my day job, uh, standing at the blackboard writing some mathematics down. So I'm a mathematical biologist, uh, and uh, that's the reaction I usually get when I tell people I'm a mathematical biologist, uh, sort of stunned silence. People don't really understand how something which they perceive as being really pure and rigorous, like mathematics, they don't really understand how that can relate to something which maybe is as, as messy and real world applicable uh, as biology. I think that comes from when we're at school, if you like science but you don't like sums or equations then you do biology because, because you don't have to do sums or equations in biology but if you like science and you can't stand cutting stuff up, which is pretty much the case with me, then you do mathematics instead. Uh, that, that happened to me, I, I basically, during GCSE biology, which I really enjoyed, uh, there were se several lessons where we had like a dead fish in the room or an eyeball uh, and I basically fainted uh, in one of these sessions and decided that I couldn't possibly do A-level biology because I couldn't handle uh, the pressure of having to cut things up. So I ended up doing maths and further maths and physics and chemistry at A-level because I did like science. And I, uh, I went on to university and I did mathematics and I thought this is a shame because my chance of understanding and discovering more about biology is, is basically over now. But as it happens, um, mathematics turns out to be an incredibly good way to understand the world around us. So engineers use mathematics to help make sure the planes stay in the air or to build bridges that aren't going to fall down or get blown over. In physics we use mathematics to understand the quantum effects at subatomic levels or to understand how mass can bend space-time in the theory of general relativity. We use maths in chemistry, we use it in finance, we use it in economics, we use it all over the place. We use it in the movies to try and cre create computer-generated images of scenes that just couldn't possibly be realised in the real world. We use it on the internet to keep our details safe. We use it in sport to enhance the performance of our top athletes. I guess what I'm trying to say is that mathematics is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. No more so is that true than in biology. So I've told you that I'm a mathematical biologist, but I haven't really told you what it is that mathematical biology is. And there's a number of different levels of explanation that I can give you. So at one level, mathematical biology is, is taking a biological system that we're interested in. It might be the heart, for example and writing down a series of equations or a computer model which, which we think represents what the heart is doing and trying to use that model to make predictions about what the heart will do in certain other situations. At a deeper level though, it's a philosophy. It's a way of thinking about biology. Uh, it's a way to try and understand and answer some of the most pressing problems that are affecting medicine and physiology and biology and ecology in the 21st century. So we already use mathematical biology all over the place. We've used it to model uh, the heart to try and understand what happens if you have a blood clot in the heart and what happens to that particular organ. Uh, we've used it in genetics to try and model gene regulatory networks and see what happens if there's a slight change to the status quo. What if there's a single mutation in one of the three billion uh, base pairs of the, of the DNA? We use it to inform policy. So uh, we look at fisheries, for example, to try and make sure we don't overfish our seas, to set realistic targets and quotas 
for, for fishing and to make sure we preserve some of our most important species. And we use it in, in disease as well. We try to understand how viruses battle with our immune system and also how we can control the spread of epidemics like Ebola. We use mathematical biology all over the place. Um, so the, the way that we use mathematical biology, the fundamental dogma, the fundamental idea of mathematical biology is this thing called the modelling paradigm. The idea is that we, we take, um, we take a, an experimental system that we're interested in, it might be the physiology of the heart for example, and we make a load of observations. We, we work with experimental collaborators and we try to learn as much about the biology of the heart as we possibly can. And then we go away to the next step of this iterative process and we build a model. So as mathematicians, we go away and we sit at our desk or our blackboard and we write down a series of equations or a computer model and we, we try to put as much of the biology into those equations and those models as possible. And then we use those models to make a prediction about what this system will do under certain circumstances that we haven't seen yet. So we make a prediction and we go back to our experimental collaborators and we say, can you test this system for us please? And they say, mm, I don't know. And they say, yeah, okay, yeah, fine, we'll do it, we'll do it. We'll do it. And, they, and they, do, they do the experiment. And we come back and they say, your model's rubbish. <laughs> You, you've got it completely wrong. And for most people, that's really disappointing. Actually, for mathematical biologists, that's a really good thing. Because what it means is that we've missed some biology out of our model. It means we, there's something we didn't capture in our model. And we can do experiments and find out more about the biology. And we can interpret what that biology means and put it back into a new version of our model. So we keep going around the cycle. We, we get a new version of the model and we make new predictions. And once we make those predictions, we test them. And we get them wrong again. And we keep going around this cycle until we get a model that we're satisfied with, a model that we're really happy is representing the true physiology. And then we can start to use this model. So for example, you might represent the physiology of the heart. Mathematical biologists have done a lot of work on developing really accurate models of the heart, and they're used all over the place now. So you get a patient coming into hospital, you can do scans of that patient's heart, and you can build an, individual, uh, an individualized version of that patient's heart on a computer. You've got a, real, a, a virtual reality version of their heart. And you can test what will happen when you put certain drugs into that person's heart, what will happen. It's much safer than actually giving the person those drugs which you don't necessarily know what, know what they'll do. Similarly, drug companies are really using these models a great deal. If you're trying to get a, a new drug out into the public, um, you have to go through lots of phases of expensive clinical trials. But what we can do now is test the effect of those drugs on our, on our computer model of the heart, and the ones that don't work, we throw them away immediately. So we save ourselves going through a lot of clinical trials. We save the drug companies money, makes the drugs cheaper, and that gets passed on to us as the consumers, patients, the NHS, saves a great deal of money. The other great thing that we can do with these mathematical models is we can reduce the amount of animal experimentation we need to do. So instead of doing an experiment in a real-life animal, we can do it on a computer. We can do what's called an in silico experiment in a computer and dramatically reduce the, the number of animals that we use. So mathematical biology is really transforming biology from what it was in the 20th century, which is the descriptive science describing what's happening, into a 21st century predictive science where we can actually predict what's going to happen in certain circumstances. So I want to tell you uh, a little example from my own research uh, to show how mathematical biology works. I work in embryo forms. Uh, in particular, I'm interested in a subgroup of cells of the early embryo, which are called the neural crest cells. These neural crest cells are an incredibly important group of cells. They go on to contribute to a wide range of different tissues in the adult, so parts of the heart, uh, the eye, the gut, the bone marrow. And if something goes wrong with the migration of these neural crest cells, the movement of these cells, they don't get to the right place or there aren't enough of them, then you get a whole range of diseases which are called neurochristopathies. Now these neurochristopathies range in severity from a very mild end, you have things like piebaldism, which is a, a defect in pigmentation, not so serious. But at the very severe end, you have things like Hirschsprung's disease, which is where you get um, the nerve cells that are supposed to connect the gut, they don't, they don't make it to the right place, so your gut isn't properly elevated. And what that means is you can't peristalse, you can't push the food through your gut, so you get chronic blockages and obstructions of the gut. It's an incredibly painful, unpleasant procedure, um, unpleasant disease. Um, even more extreme than that, there's things like neurofibromatosis, which is a predisposition to certain types of cancers. So um, there's a very, they're a very serious uh, set of diseases. I'm particularly interested in uh, a subgroup of these neural crest cells, which are called melanocytes. Melanocytes make melanin, uh, so they're responsible for pigmentation in hair and skin. Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in uh, whether these melanocytes can migrate to the right place, and, whether, and if they don't, what happens? The melanocytes start at the back of the embryo, in this region called the neural crest and they try to migrate from the back 
all the way around to the front and cover the region that they've migrated over evenly. So you get a nice even pigmentation pattern in your skin. In particular, I'm interested in this region between the back and the front and also between the limbs. It's called the trunk region that you can see highlighted. So, uh, what I do generally as a mathematical modeler, try to simplify things. I take this region between the back and the front and between the limbs, and I unwrap it, and I put it down on the table, or if you like, I put it down on the stage, and I make it into a grid. Okay, and then I put, put cells in this grid, and I give them certain rules about how they can move. So the red uh, sites in the lattice here are cells, and the black sites are just empty space. So there's nothing in them. And then the cells can, can move around on this lattice, and I'll tell you about the rules. But what I'm going to ask for now is a little bit of audience participation. So if I've spoken to you before, uh, then please uh, stand up now and come down to the front of the stage and help me out. With this, uh, okay. So uh, I've got my first ten people who are standing on my grid, in the first three rows of the grid. And they've all got a tetrahedral dice, so one of these things. It's a four-sided dice that's going to help us move on. I'll explain a bit more about it in a second. Uh, so everyone on the grid has got their dice, get ready to your dice. People who are standing on the side ready to come in, uh, I'll explain how this is going to work. Okay, so there's two rules uh, with which we're going to move around on this grid. So there's going to be a movement rule. So the idea is that if you start in the configuration on the left here, you're going to um, have empty space around you. And what you can do in the next step, as long as there isn't a cell in the site that you're trying to move into, is you move in one of the four neighbouring direct directions. So you can move in, in front of you, to the left, to the right, or behind you, depending on what you roll in the dice. That's the movement rule. The other rule is proliferation rule. So this time, what you can do is to make a daughter cell. Proliferation just means the cells divide and they make a daughter cell. And so you can, again, place a daughter cell in any of the four neighbouring sites. Uh, of the lattice, so again in front of you, to the left, to the right, or behind you, depending on what you're rolling on the dice. Again, if there's a cell in the site uh, that uh, you're trying to move into or to proliferate into, you don't do that movement. Okay. So those are the rules. So how am I going to make this work in my human cellular automaton? Well, here's the key. So I'm going to ask you all to face to the right, so that's towards me, which you all do, very good. Uh, and then this is the key. So one is going to be forwards, two is going to be left, three is going to be backwards, and four is going to be right. Don't worry about remembering it, I'll flash it up on the screen as it happens. Um, if an M comes up on the screen, then what I'm going to ask you to do is to do a movement event. So you're going to roll your dice, just do it from hand to hand rather than onto the floor. Then you have to scrabble around and pick it up. So roll your dice from hand to hand, interpret what number it is. Uh, so in these tetrahedral dice, they don't have a face which is facing upwards. Instead, they have numbers all around the side, and it's the number which is on the bottom of all of the faces that you can see which is your roll. So for example, in the yellow dice there, you roll the two. In the green dice, you roll the four, a white three, red dice there is two. Okay, so that's how you can interpret the dice. Um, so if, you, if there's an M on the screen, you roll your dice, you find out what number it is, you find out what direction that corresponds to, and then you look to see if that site you're trying to move into is full. If the site is full, you're not going to move. Even if someone moves out of that site during that movement event, you're just going to stay where you are. But if it's empty, then we'll all move into those empty sites together. Um, the next thing you can do is a proliferation event. So if a P comes up on the screen, again, you roll your dice. This time you do something slightly different. You check to see if the, the site you're trying to proliferate into, to make a daughter cell uh, into, is empty. And if it is empty, then what you do is you, you stand up as high as you can so people off the stage can see you, and you point down towards the lattice site in which you're going to place a daughter site into. So people from off the stage then come and fill in, and they are your daughter cells, but they're just identical to everyone else. They follow exactly the same rule. Okay. Hopefully everyone's got it. So let's try a movement event first. So roll your dice from hand to hand. Uh, there's the key. Check which direction you've been uh, told to move into. If it's free, then let's move into those sites now. Just one of you. So everyone else is moving into a site that was spot fine. Very good. That's how it should work. Okay. So um, I use this sort of model, this, this human cellular automaton, to investigate a disease which is called piebaldism. So in piebaldism, the defect in, in the pigmentation pattern in the skin, you tend to get these white belly spots and forehead spots where your melanocytes, your pigment-producing cells, haven't managed to migrate to. Okay, so um, there's a debate in the biology about how this is caused. Some people think it's because the melanocytes just aren't migrating fast enough. They just don't manage to make it to the front. Other people think it's because the like, melanocytes aren't proliferating they're not making enough daughter cells. And so we're going to try and use the mathematical model to understand which of these two cases it is. Okay, so let's try a proliferation event. So roll your dice again. Okay, check to see which direction you're going to move into. And point to that direction if it's empty. Okay, if, if there's someone in there, you don't point. But if it's empty, you point. And let's have some people come in to fill in as high as you can so everyone can see. Hands right up in the air and point them downwards. One more to come in. Uh, two more, in fact. Yeah, one here. Well, great, thank you. Okay, so that's the proliferation event, filling. 
But this is what I'm hoping to get. I'm hoping to get a, a full colonization, even spread of these cells across the domain if I don't have a problem with my colonization. Um, let's try a movement event. So let's roll your dice. Okay, check to see what direction it means. If it's, if it's empty, then you can move into it now. Right? Very good. So still, we're quite dense at the back there, so not many movement events going on. Okay, that's very good. Uh, if I've got a mutation in a gene called uh, KIT, which is ironic because it means that uh, I can pretend that I discovered a gene, it's obviously not the case, but that's, that's uh, what's happening. If there's a mutation in a gene called KIT, uh, then what you see is that these melanocytes don't manage to proliferate uh, enough, they don't get to the front of the embryo, and, uh, and you get this white belly spot. So um, let's try a proliferation event, so roll your dice, check the direction you're going to move into and point into that direction if, if it's empty, and we have some people filling in, fantastic. So it might surprise you to know that generally, I don't uh, do this uh, with humans very often. I use, I use this model on a computer more often than not. Uh, it's much more reliable, much faster, I can do it more quickly. Uh, and this is what it's supposed to look like. So I can run this mathematical model, which is now nice and efficient. I can run this uh, many times over, and I can actually tweak the parameters in the model, so I can see what happens when I reduce the amount of movement the cells are allowed to do. I can see what happens when I reduce the amount of proliferation. And what we're able to find using this mathematical model is that you can reduce the amount that these cells move by quite a, a large amount, and you still see the full colonization of the embryo. But when you start to reduce the amount that these cells proliferate, then you find you see these white belly spots. So we were able to answer this biological question of which one. So we'll finish with a couple more events, so let's have a movement event. So roll your dice, determine which direction you're going to go move into, and just wait until, if it's empty, then you can move down. Very good. Okay, let's do one more proliferation event then. So roll your dice, check to see the direction. If it's empty, put your hand up and point towards that site. Side your balance, have some people filling in. One, two, three, four, five people, please. Thank you very much. Please come in. Okay, so that's, that's how the mathematical model works. I hope uh, that I've been able to uh, explain to you that Mathematics is pretty ubiquitous, it's all, it's all over the place. By using an example from my research, I've hope, I hopefully showed you uh, that mathematical biology or maths can actually say something useful about biology. Maths is everywhere, and no more so is that the case than when trying to understand the beauty of biology when we're trying to write down the mathematics of life. Thank you.